All right. So now we're going to get into how banks work, which will be, a, which will entail a lot of weird things. And we're talking about the money supply and what that is. It's just, it's, there's a lot. All right. Just, just, just buckle up, prepare yourself um, for, uh, for this section. Okay. So bank panics. What's a bank panic? All right. Well, basically you have to go back to how, how banks operate. You give your money to the bank. Okay. They take your money, they give it to somebody else. They loan it out to somebody else. They charge that person in interest. That's how they make money. If you, if I gave the money to the bank and the, the money just sat there, they won't make any money. So the way they make money is by loaning it out, charging people interest. Okay. So everybody puts their money in the bank. The bank then loans that money out to other people. They hold a little bit of it back. Okay. So everything works here as long as we, we all don't go ask for our money back. If we do that, the bank's not going to have enough to cover it. Remember, someone else is walking around with my money. Okay. If I go and ask just me, the bank will take some money from other people, you know, that they have in reserve, give it to me and they're good. They don't like it. I mean, if you, if you ever want to know, go to your bank and ask for, ask to close your account, ask for all your money, see what happens. All right. They're going to try to convince you not to do that. Uh, but if it's just you, they'll have enough to cover it. The issue comes when everybody goes and asks for it. Then what happens is the bank doesn't have the money. The bank goes out of business. The bank goes under. And if you didn't get your money in time, you're out of luck. Nowadays, we have what's called deposit insurance, where the federal government guarantees deposits up to 250000 So even if my bank goes out of business because we all asked for our money back, um, or they made some bad investments and wherever, for whatever reason, my deposits are still guaranteed. And this is actually in response to the Great Depression when many people lost their life savings when banks uh, went, uh, went out of money, uh, went, went under. But without the deposit insurance, so without the deposit insurance, what's, what happens is when you see that the bank is failing, your incentive is to go and get your money as fast as you can. Um, and so this, this creates what's called a bank run. Everybody realizes, oh no, the bank might go out of business. That induces everybody to go there, and then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now that we've all gone there and asked for our money, now the bank will certainly go out of business. So the deposit insurance kind of acts as this buffer to get people to stop running to ask for their money back, and that kind of saves banks from, from going under. So this didn't happen in the 19... This, the, the deposit insurance wasn't there in the 1930s, so we had this process where the banks would start to get in trouble, then everyone would rush to get their money, and then they'd really be in trouble and fail. Now we don't necessarily have that problem. We have deposit insurance, but we have a different problem because of deposit insurance. Basically, um, deposit insurance is the federal government saying to banks, we got your back. Don't worry. You know, your, the, the, your source of income, which is loaning other people's money out, we're guaranteeing that. So it's like this implicit subsidy to banks from government saying like, we'll bail you out. You know, they'll bail them out in other ways, but this is like a direct written in the law, we will bail out your, uh, your deposits. And this encourages then risky behavior on the part of, uh, of banks. Uh, this is what we call moral hazard in economics. Okay. So, but back in the 1930s, there's no FDIC. There's no, this, there's no de deposit insurance. So the banks start failing. And then this just kind of ripples through the rest of the economy. You know, in one town, they'll hear that the bank failed in the other town. This will cause a run on the banks in that town. And boom. And then that bank will fail. Um, by the way, banking back then is very small scale. Um, and so, you know, each town has its own bank. It's not like now where there's like these massive banks. It's like each town has its own uh, little bank. And so what happens is all these banks start failing. You know, the, as the crops goes bad and, and the farmers default on their loans, as, as people default on their, their loans and they get foreclosed on, you know, lots of banks start failing. Now, in the present, this is when the Federal Reserve, which is our central bank, our lender of last resort, will kind of step in and prop up the banks so these problems don't filter through, don't domino through the rest of the economy. But the Fed had a very hands-off approach in the Great Depression. They didn't really uh, intervene. Also, it's important to note, is bank, a bank failing now is a big deal. Banks failed all the times uh, back in the 1920s and 30s. So here's the number of bank failures here and then the value of the deposits that were lost. These are just different figures. So you can see, and again, there's lots of small banks. So it's like, it's not, it's pretty normal, not normal, but it's not, it's a regular occurrence. Like there's like 500 banks that fail in 1921, 600 or so in, in 1927. 
So even though it shoots up here in the Great Depression, you know, it's not necessarily something where it, it feels out of the ordinary yet, you know, even though it was out of ordinary statistically. But remember, this is like, you know, early, you know, this is early, early 20th century. It's not like we have like, these things weren't like, um, the data wasn't like readily uh, available. So that's one of the reasons why the Fed didn't really step in. Is it like, it's sort of the natural banking process, you know, it was accepted that some banks might go under. So we didn't necessarily recognize that there was, you know, a crisis going on in, in, until it was too late. All right, so what is going to happen? What's going to be the effect of all these bank failures? All right. And so in order to think about the effect, we have to talk about the money supply. What is the money supply? This is how much money is out there. Here's the definition right here. Currency plus deposits. So it's money that people have in their pocket that they're walking around with. And then it's money that people have in the bank that they can easily get their hands on, that they can go uh, withdraw from the bank, deposits. You know, I call this effective money. It's like money that people act like they have. This other thing is the monetary base. This is how much money there actually is. Remember, what, what's going on here is the bank, I put my money in the bank. The bank then loans it out. So my money actually isn't in the bank. Somebody else has it. But I'm acting like my money's in the bank. All right? That's counted in, um, in the money supply. The monetary base, I call what's, how much money there actually is. So this would be currency, money in people's pockets, and then money that's actually in the bank, money that's in their vaults, their reserves. Okay. There's going to be a connection between the two um, that essentially, oh, no, this is a typo. There's a typo right here. Oh, I thought I updated this. This should be the money. Oh, hold on. Let me just, let me just, let me just write on here. So we don't, so you don't get this wrong. And then I'll change, I'll make sure to change the supply. The, 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 the I thought I changed this. Sorry. The money supply. This should be the money supply. Cross that out. Okay. There we go. All right. So the relationship between the two is the money supply is the money multiplier times the money base. Okay. Money, money multiplier times the money base. So the money supply, the effective money, the money that people think they have is larger than the money base, which is um, how much money there actually uh, is. Okay. And so next page, sorry about that typo. All right. And so as I mentioned, why is the money supply bigger than the money base? All right, this is because money is counted more than once. When I deposit my hundred dollars in, in the bank, uh, or let's take Fred. Fred deposits $100 in the bank. The bank takes Fred's $100 and loans it to Mary. Mary buys a phone from Apple for 100 bucks. Apple deposits the 100 bucks in the bank. So essentially, Fred and Apple have both deposited the same $100. This $100 has, is being counted twice, okay? And now they're both acting as if they have $100, even though um, you know, the bank actually doesn't have that you know, in reserve to cover it if they were to ask for it, but they are acting as if. So basically the, mo the money gets loaned out, deposited, loaned out, deposited, loaned out a bunch of times. So that's why the money supply, the money that people act as if they have, is larger than the money base, which is how much money there actually is. You think about it in the modern world, if we were all just to go take our money out of the banks, there would not be enough actual hard currency to cover all that money uh, being taken out. Okay, so I know that's, I know that's confusing as illustrated by this meme right here. Um, but what's important here is to think about the money supply, which depends on the money base and this money multiplier is going to depend on a couple different things. The deposit to reserve ratio, how much do we allow the banks to loan out and the currency to deposit ratio, how much are people going to have, how much of their money are people going to keep in the bank? So basically the money supply grows just mechanically if we allow the banks to loan out more money because it gets loaned out then loaned out again, then loaned out again, or if people decide to hold more money in the banks. That's what's important here is like, okay, the money supply is just going to grow. The, the amount of money that people act as if they have is going to grow if we let the banks loan out more money or if people start putting more money in banks because this fractional reserve banking just creates money. It creates a bunch of money that actually doesn't uh, exist because we allow them to loan out uh, these, they, we essentially allow them to loan out my money. All right.
And so what happens in response to all these bank panics, so let's think of the natural human response to all these banks going under. If I'm a bank, if I'm another bank, I'm going to say, whoa, I need to hold way more in reserve. I'm not going to be loaning this money out. People might come ask for their money. So that's going to reduce this deposit to reserve ratio. That's the banks are going to stop loaning money out. They're going to hold it in reserve in case people ask for their money out back. People are going to say, I'm not putting money in the bank. No way. That bank might go out of business. I'm keeping it in my mattress. So the deposit to currency ratio is also shrinking. And so here's the equation for the money multiplier. It's not important for this class, but just there's an actual equation for it. Um, so because of this, the banks are holding on to their money. Households are holding on to their money. Our money supply, the amount of money that's effectively out there is going to drop. And so we have this massive dip in the money supply. This is also going to cause inflation so or deflation. So deflation is directly related to how much money is there. If there's lots of money out there, prices are going to go up. If there's less money out there, prices are going to go down. So this is also going to cause deflation. So we have all these deflationary pressures that are happening. People are scared. They're spending less. The banks are scared. They're loaning out less. Households are putting much, much less money in the banks. All of these are pushing prices uh, down. All right. And so we have this crash leading to uncertainty, lowered consumption. That's going to lead to deflation. That's going to lead to default, even more lower consumption. There's people defaulting on their houses because remember now in real terms, their loans are higher. It's more deflation. So we get this deflationary spiral. Um, you know, also there's going to be the farmers are going to default on their loans because of the crash that's going to lead to bank panics. And we just covered how that's also going to lead to deflation. So we have all this deflationary pressure. So when, when prices drop by that much, that's really bad for the economy. Okay. And so what should be done? Well, this is the job of the federal reserve. This is what we call monetary policy. Monetary policy is the federal reserve, our central bank taking a look at what's going on with the money supply and trying to correct for anything that's gone awry. So here we have a big thing that's gone wrong. We have massive deflation. This is the job of the Federal Reserve to step in, add some money to the money supply, get prices to come back up, get the economy moving again. That's what they should do. They did not do that. Why didn't they do that? Tune in next time to find out.